All right, good evening. Welcome to the 2022 Iowa City Book Festival presented by the Iowa City UNESCO City of Literature Organization. My name is John Kenyon. I'm the executive director of the organization, and I'd like to thank you for coming out and joining us this evening. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the sponsors who make the festival possible. The City of Iowa City, the University of Iowa, our hosts here at the Iowa City Public Library, Prairie Lights Books, Iowa Public Radio, the Graduate Hotel, and Think Iowa City. So thanks to all of those folks, again, for making this possible. So we're about halfway through this year's festival, and I hope you'll be able to join us for some of the other events that we will have in the coming days. The print program that you hopefully picked up on your way in or that you can grab on your way out will list all of the different things that we have going on uh, between now and the end of the festival on the 13th. We have many uh, events tomorrow and Sunday back in this room, meeting room A at the library, as well as other things going on in other locations. If you're watching us on the stream, you can visit Iowa City bookfestival.org for the full schedule. This evening, we're delighted to present Curtis Bauer and Maria Sanchez. Curtis Bauer is a poet and translator. The Iowa native's third and most recent poetry collection is American Selfie. He's given readings, lectures, and taught workshops in Spanish and English across the US and in Argentina, Ecuador, Mexico, Venezuela, and Spain. And most recently, he taught writing workshops in Spanish for the Lines and Spaces program, a literary partnership with the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the US Department of State and the International Writing Program here at the university. He divides his time between Spain and Texas, and he's translated several works of Spanish poetry and prose, including the newly published memoir, Land of Women, by our other guest, Maria Sanchez. Sanchez is a third-generation Spanish veterinarian whose memoir looks at how we view women in rural life. Following in the footsteps of generations before her, she travels the countryside of Spain, bearing witness to a life eroding before her eyes. She is the first woman in her family to dedicate herself to what has traditionally been a male-dominated profession and rebuffs the bucolic narrative of rural life often written by and for consumption by people in cities describing the multi-layered social complexity of people who are proud, resilient, and often misunderstood. Part memoir and part rural feminist manifesto, Land of Women acknowledges the sacrifices of Sanchez's female ancestors who enabled her to become the woman that she is. And so I'd like to ask Curtis Bauer to join me up here, and he and uh, Maria Sanchez will have a little conversation and share some of the writing that is in, found in the book. So thank you very much. I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you all for coming, and it's great to see you, Maria, again, right? This is how we know each other uh, across Zoom. We haven't actually met face-to-face -face <laughs> other than through a screen, right? But um, I'm going to say a few things. Uh, I guess it's a kind of introduction, reintroduction, um, but when this book came out, uh, in May, Maria sent a tweet out into the world that said something like, who would have thought the granddaughter of Carmen La Gordita would one day cross the ocean and be translated into English? And I immediately thought of my maternal grandfather, a farmer from Germany I grew up with, but then I checked myself and I thought, you know, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you know, this, I should be thinking of my grandmothers. And the idea, you know, I mean, what all of that's about is that I hardly knew them. There were women who were silenced, not by force, but because they weren't given the opportunity to speak or to be listened to. Nesta Roberts, born in Wales in 1908 and taken to the U.S. as a baby and who hardly ever left Iowa after that. Would she, what would she have thought of her grandson going back across the ocean to translate Maria Sanchez into English? So eventually her grandson, her granddaughter, and great-granddaughters um, might eventually then wonder about her life and stories. Or Irva Schwarting, born in rural Williamsburg, Iowa in 1919, um, first wife of Edward Schwarting, and then when he died, she married his brother, William Schwarting, my grandfather, the farmer. Irva, the farmer's wife, the baker, the canner, the cook, and the woman who taught me how to hold a fork and knife, to sit proper in public, what was her childhood like? Why didn't I ask her? 
um, to talk about her childhood? These are some of the questions that kind of came up, you know, as I, I was thinking about Maria's book. And this book is, is one of the, that addresses silence and shadows and ignorance. And it's not just a call to action or a feminist manifesto, but also a manual for approaching identifying, preserving, and valuing what's on the verge of being lost. We're going to talk about a few of those things tonight. We're going to read a section. Maria will read something in Spanish, and then I'll read that, that, my translation of that. Um, and afterwards, you'll have the opportunity to participate in a conversation with us. Um, if you've got a question, please you know, call for the microphone so that Maria can hear the question and also those people uh, watching online. So, Maria, I'll turn it over to you, and you can jump in. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy sharing uh, this meeting with, with you. Um, first, I want to say thanks to all of you for making it possible. So, as Carte say, I'm going to start reading uh, a part of Land of, of Women. In Spanish, por un medio rural vivo. A veces siento que los habitantes del medio rural y los de las ciudades hablamos en un lenguaje diferente, que no nos entendemos. Nos oímos, reconocemos el rostro y los gestos, pero no nos escuchamos. Las palabras quedan suspensas en el aire, pero no llegan a germinar en ningún sustrato. Ambos formamos parte de un diálogo, pero no existe entendimiento. Como si el idioma agigantara la distancia entre el campo y la ciudad. Como si el encuentro cara a cara sucediera de cada lado solo frente a un espejo opaco que nunca devuelve la imagen. El escritor vasco Bernardo Achaga Comienza su libro Marca, en el que escribe sobre los muertos sin nombre y con paradero desconocido en la tragedia de Guernica, con una reflexión preciosa alrededor de una inscripción estallada en una roca que se encuentra en un museo de Milán. El mazo de Bormo no es una piedra cualquiera. Las marcas en la roca tienen 7000 años. No se entienden. No hay lugar a la lectura. No existe la idea de un idioma o de un mensaje. Solo son marcas. Incisiones en una piedra de alguien que quiso dejar su huella ahí. No sabemos por qué, con qué interés o si significaban algo. Pero lo que no se puede leer ni entender llega igualmente hasta nosotros. Podemos ver ese idioma desconocido, tocarlo, intentar descifrarlo. ¿Y si no importa qué dice? ¿Y si la marca tuviera otro fin más allá de causa o fines? Achaga traduce, las incisiones no se entienden pero siguen latiendo, porque transmiten un mensaje, consiguen traernos miles de años después un mensaje claro y poco rebatible. Estuvimos aquí, un día estuvimos vivos aquí. La marca es la piedra, como la brecha que señala pero a la vez espera. Me reconozco en este fragmento de Achaga, un medio rural que intenta contar su historia, dar a conocer sus problemas. Un territorio lleno de personas que no quieren irse y que hacen lo posible por no tener que hacerlo. Que agitan los brazos pidiendo auxilio, que señalan la ausencia, que inciden en lo que tenemos que preservar. Pero la marca está hecha. Y los que están fuera empiezan ahora a reconocerla. Hablan sobre despoblación, falta de recursos y servicios, cambio climático, naturaleza, conservación, pero no terminan de encontrar la lengua exacta para no quedarse solo en los conceptos, para ir más allá de titulares que no terminan de contar y de enseñar el verdadero rostro de nuestro medio rural y sus habitantes. ¿Y si necesitamos un nuevo lenguaje para tender puentes entre el campo y la ciudad? Y si entre todos tenemos que volver a aprender a nombrar. A pesar de mis raíces, de mi trabajo y de mi vínculo tan intenso con el medio rural, yo también me convierto muchas veces en esa forastera que llega a un lugar donde habla una lengua diferente que no entiende. 
Es especialmente doloroso cuando te das cuenta de que esto te sucede hasta con tu propia familia. En algún momento caí en que no entendía muchas de las palabras que usaba mi familia para hablar de su día a día o para comunicarse conmigo. Palabras que tantas veces había oído sin prestarle atención. No las conocía. No sabía qué significaban. No formaban parte de mi lengua. Este despertar se convirtió en una obsesión. Empecé a preguntar y cada palabra desconocida se convertía de pronto en una nueva para mí. Me volví otra vez niña. Aprovechaba cada momento para señalar y preguntar. Y no solo con mis padres, mis tíos y mi abuelo. También la mano que apunta y la voz que cuestiona llegaba a la gente de los pueblos a los que iba a trabajar y los ganaderos y ganaderas con los que paso prácticamente la mayor parte de mis días. Una parte de mí sigue sintiéndose culpable. Si yo, que me muevo entre el campo y la ciudad, empezaba a perder la lengua rural, el idioma de los míos, ¿hasta qué punto no ha desaparecido ya para los que viven en las ciudades? Hice la prueba. Empecé a recoger esas palabras como semillas y las metí en un cuaderno, resguardadas, apretadas contra mí, como se hace cuando se recogen las semillas y se colocan en un papel para secarlas. Y una vez preparadas, se guardan en botecitos de cristal en la despensa o en el cuartillo para la próxima siembra. Así fue como las palabras de mi familia comenzaron a viajar del pueblo a la ciudad y a conocer una nueva tierra a la que agarrarse. Cuando estaba entre amigos, en el trabajo o en algún encuentro literario, no podía evitar sacar el cuaderno y lanzar alguna palabra sin revelar el significado. La arrojaba como el agricultor lanza la semilla a la tierra, esperando que terminaran agarrando, alcanzaran a brotar y dieran su fruto. La mayoría de las palabras que traigo a la ciudad son desconocidas, pero despiertan algo que no se puede nombrar, que llevamos dentro y que sigue ahí, latente, esperando la luz adecuada para hacerse notar. Sacan del sueño un interés que consigue que el idioma de mi familia y de tanto siga vivo. Y rescatan algo más. Las palabras desconocidas despiertan preguntas a los suyos, nuevos nombres, antiguos recuerdos. Rescatan el vínculo y consiguen traer a la superficie un nuevo idioma sobre el, el que empezar a trabajar. Palabras como fardela, el saco o talega de los pastores. Como galiana un camino más pequeño de los trashumantes, como Cabellano, ese terreno en la sierra que es llano, con lomas y valles pero suaves, como Empollo, la primera hierba que nace en otoño tras las primeras lluvias, como Jabardillo, ese conjunto de aves más pequeño que una bandada. So this is from the fifth chapter um, in the book called For, living, For a Living Rural Community. Sometimes I feel as if rural people and city dwellers speak a different language, that we don't understand each other. We hear each other, we recognize each other's faces and gestures, but we don't listen to each other. Words remain suspended in the air, but they don't germinate in any substrate. We're both part of a dialogue, but we don't understand each other, as if language widened the distance between the countryside and the city, as if the face-to-face -face encounter occurred on each side only in front of an opaque mirror that never shows a reflection. The Basque writer Bernardo Achaga begins his book, Marx, in which he writes about the unnamed and unaccounted for dead in the Guernica tragedy, with a beautiful reflection about some inscriptions carved into a rock in a museum in Milan. El Maso di Bormo isn't just any stone. The marks on the rock are 7,000 years old. They're unintelligible. There's no way to read them. The idea of a language or a message doesn't e exist. They're just marks, incisions in a stone by someone who wanted to leave a mark there. We don't know why, with what intent, or if they meant anything, but what can't be read or understood reaches us all the same. We can see that unknown language, touch it, try to decipher it. What if it doesn't matter what it says? What if the mark had another purpose beyond causes or intentions. Achaga translates, the incisions aren't understood, but they continue pulsing because they transmit a message. 
Thousands of years later, they managed to bring us a clear and hardly disputable message. We were here. One day, we were alive. The mark on that stone, like the opening that indicates, but at the same time separates. I recognize myself in Achaga's fragment, a rural community that attempts to tell its story, to make its problems known, a territory full of people who don't want to leave and do everything possible so they don't have to. We wave our arms for help. They point out the absences. They're the ones who have an impact on what we have to preserve. But the mark has been made, and those on the outside are now beginning to acknowledge it. They talk about depopulation, lack of resources and services, climate change, nature, conservation. But they never seem to find the exact language to move beyond the concepts, to move beyond headlines that never fully express and show the true face of our rural environment and its inhabitants. What if we need a new language to build bridges between the rural and the urban? What if all we have to once again, what if we all have to once again learn how to name? Despite my roots, my work, and my intense bond with the rural environment, I too often become that stranger who arrives in a place where they speak a different language she doesn't understand. It's especially painful when you realize this happening to you even with your own family. At some point it dawned on me that I didn't understand many of the words my family used to talk about their daily lives or to communicate with me, words I'd heard so many times without paying attention to them. I wasn't familiar with them. I didn't know what they meant. They weren't part of mi lingua, my tongue, my language. This awakening turned into an obsession. I started asking questions and every unfamiliar word suddenly became new to me. I became a little girl again. I took advantage of every moment to point and ask. And not only with my parents, my aunts and uncles, and my grandparents. The pointing had Hand and the questioning voice also reached the people in the towns where I went to work and the herds, women, and men I spent almost all of my days with. Part of me still feels guilty. If I, someone who moves between the country and the city, was beginning to lose my rural tongue, the language of my people, to what extent had it not already disappeared for those who live in the cities? I tested it out. I began to collect those words like seeds, and I put them in a notebook, safeguarded them, held them close, as you do when you gather seeds and place them on paper to dry them, and once they're ready, save them in little glass jars in the pantry or in the storeroom for the next sowing. That's how the words of my family began to travel from our town to the city and to recognize a new soil to cling to. When I was with my friends at work or at some literary event, I couldn't help taking out my notebook and tossing out a word or two without revealing the meaning. I threw them out like a farmer sows seeds onto the soil, hoping they would take root, sprout, and bear fruit. Most of the words I carry to the city are unknown, but they awaken something that can't be named, that we carry inside and that is still there, latent, waiting for the right light to be detected. They rouse from sleep an interest that keeps the language of my family and so many others alive. And they rescue something else. Unfamiliar words awaken questions of their own, new names, old memories. They rescue the connection and manage to bring a new language to the surface to start cultivating. Words like fardela, the backpack or sack shepherds use. Like galiana, a trace or smaller path transhumants use. Like caballano, that terrain in the mountains, which is flat with hills and valleys, but gentle ones, like empoyo, the first grass that grows in autumn after the first rains, like jabardillo, that group of birds smaller than a flock. So um, what, what we thought we would do is just start with a little bit of, maybe I'd ask her a question, but then Maybe you all have some questions or something that you're thinking about. But the first thing that, that comes to mind for me is, is this idea of language that is lost, that, that maybe we're, we're um, you know, there are these words that maybe you grew up with that you never use. And I'd like Maria to talk a little bit about 
about those words and about language that you've discovered, you know, that's on the verge of extinction, let's say. Um, and, and talk a little bit about what you're doing, like what some of your projects are and, and why you got into that. So for me, it's very important this labor of rescuing words in danger because I, I always think about every word who is in danger, who, who, who can disappear. At the end, it's like a other world dying because, you know, these words are fundamental for me. Every time one of these words like this dies, there is, or oh, I was saying, a word dying. So for me, it's not about language accent, accent as you are listening to my special accent so of Spain, or the meaning, for example, of the word. It goes beyond that because we are talking about a special way of living, um, inhabiting a territory or relating to the others, like I'm thinking animals, people, the, the land, the earth, the resources. Also, I was thinking when I am speaking in the trees, in the mushroom. So when some of these words are saying, because I, I always used to, I used to use sayings also in my poetry, in my writings. When some of these words disappear, I think that also a uh, kinship dies. Hmm. So, you know, we are living in confused, difficult time. Um, not easy era because we are living with our sanctity I'm thinking in a war, Ukrainian war, pandemics, climate change. So we are every day asking ourselves about the place we want to live in the future, also today, tomorrow. So maybe it's so important to know these words, this saying from the past that are telling us a singular way of living or relating to the others, not only the people, as I was saying, also the, the land and the, the other beings. So it's so important to know that, to think about what kind of future we want to build, to imagine, or to live in, you know? So for me, when I think that maybe I started to pick I was thinking to pick the words, like you pick the the fruits or the mushroom in the country. Maybe when I started to realize that my grandparents, one day they 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 will die. So, so people are not immortal, no. So this moment that you left, you left the childhood, uh, start to be an adult you start to realize, understand a lot of things. Uh, also, in my, in my opinion, in my experience, I started to feel like a, a kind of fears because maybe I am running late to the lives and the stories of my family. So I think also that this this hobby, this necessity of collecting and preserving the words, maybe come from this this feeling. Mm. Okay. A big part of this book is 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 about you know listening to stories and identifying you know the a kind of connection between the land and the people who are who are living on the land and you know. There are, in particular, in the in the second half of the book, focusing on three, three significant women for you. Um, 
Could you talk a little bit about, I guess, tell the audience a little bit about how you arrived at that, that kind of discovery? You know, say, for example, a narrative of, of one, of these, one of these women, just to give a little bit of insight into it. Yes, it's very, this part is very emotional because, as you say, the first part of Land of Women is more general. Is I, I try to speak about the situation in rural areas in Spain. And the second part, sorry, for me is more like a poem. It's, it's like a song for my mother, my grandma, and my great great grandma, that's Pepa. Because I needed to rescue them to the silence, to, to get them from the shadows and give them a light and give them um, a paper to, to, to tell their stories. So, you know, I think that before the, the book and the story of Pepa, it's very interesting to tell, to tell you that before the writing, it was, it was a pain, a, a, it was a pain because I discovered it, that my family never told me stories about my grandparents, parents, because they thought that it was no important, that it was no important to share, to recognize. So it's, it's hard because I have to become a writer and um, wrote my first book that is poetry, you know, the Esquadrono de Campo. It's about my family, my roots, the feeling of being a woman in a country full of men working in the, with the animals. Um, you know, this is also a book where I, I give thanks to my family for all the things I learned from that, but also it's like me saying, okay, I'm here, I'm Maria, and I'm a woman, so I can be another person and do the things well in my manner. So it took recognition and success to get to know my roots the stories of the people of my family, in special women. For example, the story of Pepa, my great-grandmother, my father started to tell me the story after he realized that this book, of this poetry book, Cuaderno de Campo, was successful and was constantly being sold and written about. So with this moment, I always, Questioning myself, how many stories have I been late for? Do you understand? How many things do we not know about because they have not been given the first unnecessary recognition? So I was happy about knowing the story of my grandma, but at the same time, I was thinking on the other woman of my family or their stories. So maybe I'm thinking always about this, these stories that are lost. Uh, um, at the end, myself as a writer, I think that every day I'm, I'm trying to write about the stories I I could never meet, I could never hear, listen, listen it to them, no? So it's very, it's like a paradox. I don't know it's the word, the exactly word, the exact word, paradoxo. It's paradoxico, no? That I'm trying to tell something that I never know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anyone have a question you want to ask? I mean, I've got plenty more, but... Maybe anyone? Okay, all right. Well, um, you know, one of the, I mean, in that, in that particular chapter, 
you know, where you're talking about your great-great-grandmother. It comes about through walking, through being outside, right? And a lot of this book is, is you know, a situation of being on the land or being in a particular place and then the story that comes from that. And, um, you know, to just think of, think of the, the generation or the, I guess, the creation or the recognition of these stories, you're asking lots of questions, right? And then those questions lead to re some responses and then more questions and more responses and it just keeps going. Um, could you talk a little bit about where, where this project, the Land of Women, is now taking you? What else are you doing that's related to, I guess, this, or that's come out of this book? I was thinking when, meanwhile, you were talking about uh, making or a question, because I just remember, you know, only Anir No, the recent novel, the French writer that just this week won the novel. She has a book when, where she writes about the abortion, about her, her abortion. And she said something like, she needs to write the things she never could find in the book. Mm -hmm. You know, this a sense of feeling that you are in the book, you are feeling identified, identified or you are asking for help or asking for something you don't know. So I was thinking about her when I was listening to you. And I don't know if I understand you well. You are asking me about what things I'm doing now. Yeah. I yeah. am. What, what has resulted from the writing of this book? Right. Wow. <laughs> there is, for me, it was a fantastic uh, surprise that I never expected that. Because of this book, there is a lot of people writing me meeting me in meets like that, talking about um, that maybe they before re read the book they felt they felt they were orphans. They I it's very linked to the quote from Onier No no or or having this space in the central narrative. So it was very it made me so happy. Uh, people who told me, oh, I could write this book myself, or you have told my, my entire life. So it's very, very nice uh, realizing that people need, needed this, not the book, this, this space to feel, to feel identified in the, in the culture, in, the, in a book, in a film, in a song. Because unfortunately, in Spain, uh, people in the villages, in rural areas, they were used to be portrayed to a simple postcard, a flat postcard, full of bucolic uh, thoughts, or with a lot of pain, anger, violence you know, in a culture. So it's like there is another light to them with this book. It's like, oh, I could be this person writing this book. And also because of land of women in Spain, um, start, uh, suddenly there were a lot of projects, similar projects to the book, interviewing far, farming women, telling their stories, a lot of feminist projects trying to rescue and to share the stories of rural, of people from rural areas. So there is a lot of things to tell, um, very good news. And also, you know, um, after of Land of Women, it um, came Almafiga, my book that is full from, for, of, Words in danger because they don't appear in, in the dictionary. And I have a lot of work <laughs> because of this book. 
it was a very very great surprise for me the how to say the um, the love of the readers with yeah. the book yeah in that book Al almasiga is it's a it's a collection a little bit like um rob mcfarland's landmarks barry lopez's um uh, what is it? Home ground, I think, is the other book. Where it's just a collection of of language or of of words that that we're losing track of or that are that aren't so common anymore. And in addition to the book, you also have a web page, right, where people can can sow those seeds of of words that you know maybe they're discovering or offering, you know, as part of that seed bed. Um, and I'm curious if you know. In, in the audience, if you've got any, if you recognize or think about any of this, if you remember words that weren't, that weren't, or maybe that you used in your youth or you heard and maybe are now, you know, you never I, I, hear them again. Yeah, I don't actually have a word, although I'll, I'll think. But I wanted to say that when Maria was reading and she made that equivalence, the metaphor of, of words as seeds, you know, in Iowa, we talk a lot about saving seeds. And particularly, I mean, I would kind of add something to that metaphor and think of it more as the heirloom seeds mm -hmm. from heirloom plants, which are ones that were original and now have been lost to hybridization and, you know, making tomatoes that are, have to be kind of squared off so that they fit in packing boxes and things of that nature. And yet the seeds that Maria is talking about, the words, are ones that are older than that, that go back to a time before we were commodifying words and um, putting them into boxes of, you know, kind of, I don't know, commercialized meaning rather than the meaning that they used to have. But now I'm going to start thinking about some words. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I grew up in rural South Dakota. And even during my lifetime, I was on a farm with my grandparents. So I saw firsthand how they lived. And between the time that I was there seeing my granddad and my neighbor, their neighbors do all the farm work with horses and my grandmother cooking on a wood stove and going to a rural schoolhouse and stuff, that it's, it's really tied to the fact that rural America, and I assume rural Spain, any rural life has changed dramatically. Um, so it's loss of an entire culture, really, um, and it's certainly bound up in words, but also in the way people lived and viewed the land. Um, it was just a different relationship to um, how they, are, they um, took care of their, their land and their animals and how they raised their children and families. It's just, it's remarkable. This has brought a lot of memories back for me um, because I certainly know that there are a lot of words as well um, that, uh, that people don't know, and it's simply because they don't do things the way they used to, um, particularly in rural, in rural life. So... Thank you. Hi. Um, I have a question. I was thinking about this because I'm, I'm from Costa Rica, and my grandmother certainly uses a lot of words because um, she was from a very small town um, that I don't recognize. And sometimes it still happens that she will say something, and I have no idea what she's talking about, but I ask in the moment what, what she means by it, and then I forget, <laughs> um, which is very unfortunate. Um, so I was wondering if this collection of seeds, um, as you call it, do you see that as a kind of um, a, a sort of museum work or as an archive, or would you like it to be something more alive that can kind of preserve these words in a way that they become part of um, our current language again, in, in a way, somehow, yeah. Thank you. 
So Sally, for me, uh, it's not about doing a collation or taking all these seats or like words and closing in a museum or a library. It's more about that. It's about speaking, carrying with yourself the, the words. And it's not only the words, you know, behind each word we are losing or this not or this word is not in the culture or in the dictionary on the narrative. Um, behind this word we have lives, we have stories, we have um, work um, unique unique and different um, works and links with the land. So now that we are in climate change, I think that it's very important to know this war and their different stories behind the wars. And it's not only the war, it's the language, the accent, the land, in special that people use this, this war. For example, in Spain, there is, is a... For me, it's very, it's very beautiful. It's very, it's, I feel like it's very emotional. We have in each territory of the country, we have different work for the same labor. And it's the labor in the villages and rural areas that is that is used to name the work in common with the, with the people of the villages. But it's not a work that is forced to do. It's a work that people from the villages want to do because it's for 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 the life, for you know, for the animal, for the for the healthy. So it's very nice this difference words to call the in Spain we say trabajo común. Los bienes comunales. I don't know, Curtis, if you know, you have this this word in particular in English. What is it? Shared work or or? Yes. Yeah. It's right. not about you have to do the work. Is mm -hmm. the work who is born because you know the people of the villages, the neighbor uh, talk and say, okay, we are going to, to build a new row, we are going to share the, the land be, to the animals cool graze, you know, mm -hmm. or to clean the roads, the path to the, path to the river, or having a, a vegetal, vegetable patch in common. So at the end, these things we are talking about now, when we are trying to imagine new futures, new cities to live in, new, new kinship between nature and people. So we, I think we could discover a lot of things in this world. But I'm not trying to live like my grandma or my great-grandma used to live because now we have a, a, a lot of things that are much better. So to me, the, the innovation could be missing, no? You know, this knowledge that unfortunately, for example, in Spain, the academy never wanted, you know, it was always see from a paternalistic view, and classic view, taking this knowledge and giving it the recognition the necessary, the fair recognition. I'm missing with the knowledge, um, you know, the technology and all the facilities we have today. Yeah, I was thinking of when I, I think there's another question yeah, over here. here okay, but it, something I was thinking of when I was a kid, um, you know, in, in Eastern Iowa, you know, there maybe a tornado would pass through in the spring, you know, in another part of the of the area in the region. And a group of people would go to help clean up that the destruction from the tornado. And you wouldn't go to get paid. You'd go to help out in the community and you'd get paid with food, 
right? I mean, it, it was some kind of a, you know, the, that labor communal help or, you know, a barn raising where people get together and, and do, this, do this to share the labor because you can't afford to pay someone, but you're all doing it and it benefits the whole, the whole group, right? Hi, thank you. Um, of course, when you think of a question a few minutes before and then people, people the conversation goes on and your question gets more and more complicated as, uh, <laughs> as you wait your turn. Uh, so I'm going to try and re reprise it, but I wanted to, I have a sort of two-part question for the two of you. One is the metaphor of fruit, uh, fruit picking as, as a research approach, uh, that this was, that, the, that these words and these experiences and these stories were, were a kind of, of fruit that you were able to pick. Uh, and I understand you could go crazy with that metaphor and then there are seeds in the fruit and stuff. But what, what, I'm, what I'm interested in is did anything resist being harvested? Did anything resist being um, taken into your research or taken into your book? Was there uh, a story or a set of experiences that was really actually very hard for you to take from the place where it was based? Uh, the, the stories that we're hearing tonight, they've made so many journeys. They've, they've journeyed from the country to you, from the past to you, from you to Curtis to, you know, and into the English language realm. So there's all of this progress and transit that's occurred, but I guess I'm sort of also interested in what wasn't able to move, what, what isn't able to be dislodged or taken away. And, and the flip side of that is sort of for Curtis, I'm really interested about the uh, phrases, not just the nouns that you discovered, not just the names for things, but the phrases that may be captured. You, you were just talking about communal work. And if there was another phrase that uh, really talked about a kind of kinship maybe with nature or with uh, a kind of feeling that maybe you discovered and whether it was a, a particular challenge, if there was one that was a particular challenge for Curtis to translate into English because that feeling would have to make a couple different jumps. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a lot of ideas. I, I, I'm sorry if I couldn't understand you very well. So, But I, uh, I think it was very interesting, your reflection, because it makes me think about... Before I'm writing, not this book in general, because I can't remove my link with the nature. I'm always in nature. I'm always looking to the trees, to the birds. So I love to go to the forest and pick mushrooms, asparagus. It's like the nature is always in my life. I'm not uh, apart from the nature and, you know, and the environment. So when I was listening to you, I was thinking, oh, my God, maybe my writing is always trying to translate the language of the nature that I never understood, you know? I'm always trying to understand the language of the trees, of the birds, of the lichen, you know, of the, of the, of the soil. So at the end, I'm thinking about the poetry, the narrative, the, at the end, the literature as a constantly translation of a lot of things, a lot of emotion. And in my case, in my experience, it's always linked to the nature. So I don't want to to think about taking something and um, removing from the land is born or, or their own place. Not this like, because it could be like, you know, anthrop anthropocentric, I don't know if it's correct to say in English, mm -hmm. or colonias or colonials way of being in the world. I prefer to see that like sharing the experience or the emotion. It's like maybe I'm trying with my writing 
to say the people who are reading to me, okay, look at this. Look, the next time you are going to the nature, look that tree, look at that animal, try to 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 hear the birds. Um, or also with with your own family, because you know, we spent a lot of time with our family, with our grandma, grandpas, or mom, but really how many times are we listening to them? Are we interested in them? And maybe when we are teens, when we are teenagers, we don't listen to them really. So it's like, I don't know how to say the, this word in, in English, but I use it a lot in Almafiga, in the book with the word seeds. Uh, Curtis, you know, pellizco, like when you are telling something, somebody, hey, look at that, uh-huh. <laughs> or with a word, with a feeling that like makes them. that this person realize, oh my God, I never told that to my grandma, or I never know, I never know the name of that bear I'm listening now mm-hmm. through the, the window, you know? Mm-hmm. Almost like pinching them or, or saying, why didn't I do this or that? Um, you know, thinking about that, that, the first part of your question, Hugh, the fruit, you know, picking as a research approach. I mean, I think that, you know, we're constantly always looking for metaphors, right? We're all, it's constant. And as she's saying, you know, imposing or, or you know, trying to, 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 I don't know. I mean, I, I think what, what, if I understand Maria correctly, she's moving against the harvest, but more of the recognition. And it's not that I'm going to take, but I'm going to see, I'm going to observe, right? So maybe instead of the fruit picking the fruit, you know, watching the whole process of it. Um, one of the things that I've thought a lot about with, you know, what isn't maybe able to move is I'm, I was pretty happy that, that there weren't a lot of those examples of those words because you start to think, well, what, do, what are those words in English, right? I'm giving a sentence description, but maybe there is a word. And then I started thinking, oh, I should try and translate almathiga. And then I thought, no, <laughs> you know, that would just be, I mean, it, it, it should be a project, right? It should be, I think, uh, something that would be healthy for for me, but also for language, for a community, right? And, and which leads me to this challenge, this idea of community. And um, we were talking a little bit about this uh, yesterday, our own, and today even, you know, what do we give up? What do we decide we're going to leave, beside, leave aside or uh, cover up so that we can move forward into something else? And, you know, it could be a way of speaking. It could be a recognition of, you know, the fact that I'm from Iowa, but I'm a writer living in New York City, you know, and I'm not going to talk about being from Iowa. You know, that kind of thing that afterwards you think, that was so stupid. Why, why does that matter, right? But I think the challenge for me in this book is recognizing what I'd given up and whether I was able to give it back, get it back. You know, what language had I forgotten? And possibly because I don't know the stories of, of my grandmothers, of a lot of people in my community, um, how can I get that back? I've lost resources, right? So that's a huge challenge and concern. And this book, you know, every time I kind of pick it up and we have this conversation, um, I, I think about that. Right. And it makes me consider, reconsider, you know, how I engage with someone in a conversation, what I'm listening, what I what I'm listening to, what I'm asking, you know, how how involved I need to be in a conversation. Right. Great. Thank you. I think we've got one last question here. Um, I, I grew up in Iowa, and all of the females in my family seemed to confide in me uh, for some reason. And I'm wondering if you could characterize the 
women's stories that you heard from your relatives, uh, mine were often tragic. Um, they didn't want to speak about uh, the tragic part of their life, um, and so that's why they, they stayed quiet. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you found the same thing. ¿Qué tipo de historias eran? ¿Qué, cómo, cómo los has entendido? Sí. I sometimes I lost the 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 wifey, so I lost some words, so I he, couldn't understand the whole question. So the question was, how would you characterize the stories? What type of stories were you told by the women in your family? And he gave the example of most of the ones that that he heard uh, were tragic. Right and or the ones that weren't told were tragic, right? It's a very interesting question because you know in Spain we have a dictatorship, and my mother, for example, the story of my mother, for me is very sad, and always I have a meeting like that. Or a lot of time I'm writing, I'm thinking about my mother. Because maybe if my mother could keep going to school, maybe the writer today here with you could be my mother. Because the story of my mother is the, is the story at the end of a lot of women in my country. You know, in the 60s, in the 70, 70s, in Spain, a lot of child, of, of kids, of women, like my mother, had to leave the school to start working in the country. For example, my mother, uh, when she was 12 years old, she had to start working with my grandpa, taking olives, ol olives from the trees, with no machines, with her own hands, you know? And she had to get up very early in the morning um, with the donkey and my grandpa they have to go walking to the mountain and come back when the sun disappears. So she used to spend all the day in the country work, working, and she never could decide about her life. And about that, you also have the dictatorship in Spain and the silence and the fear of having another war, and the machismo, and also the education. My mother was educated for, to be the perfect housewife. She's a for cleaning, cooking. She's a very good mother, but she never had the opportunity, the choice to study. So it's not only about my mother, it's about that generation of women that couldn't decide. So this is one of the questions I asked myself in the book. Where are these, those women who could write about rural areas in Spain? Because obviously they couldn't write because they had to work in the land and it's very interesting because if you for example take the story of the lives of some male writers in spain who used to write about country and nature and confront their lives lives and stories with the life and the story of women from the land they are completely different because, you know, they have power, they have money, they have the voice, the low speaker. So, for example, I'm always giving the same example, no? Comparing, I, I did it in Land of Women. I compare the life of Miguel de Libet. He was a very famous writer in Spain. He was, I love all the books about nature and rural culture culture in Spain, but I like to compare the life of this writer and my mother. And what idea of the country and the nature is different for them. For him, going to the land, to the nature, is 
it's like you, you know having a work because he spent a lot of time speaking with people from rural areas about animals about the land about the language but in, in the in the other hand the nature and the country for my mother is renunciation is having no opportunities is feeling cool because you are working in December here in my village is very cool in winter so it's very interesting to compare the life and the situation in Spain in that uh, years in that time if you were a man uh, or a, a man or a, a woman you know so um, I think that we have in Spain a lot of families with a lot of stories, but also with a, with a lot of silence, because we have to break the silence to start to tell the stories. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Maria. And Well, that brings us to the end of our time. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And thank you so much uh, to Maria for joining us. I know it is either very late or very early, depending on how you look at things uh, in Spain right now. So thank you. Thank you to Curtis for joining us. Uh, I love that we could use technology to, to bridge this geographic gap and talk about the way you two are using translation to bridge the language gap. So it, it was wonderful. Um, We've stretched our friends at Prairie Lights very thin, uh, so I had originally thought that they would be here to sell books tonight, but they do have books at the store. Uh, they're going to be uh, around and about all weekend for us, so we had to make some sacrifices, but uh, they will be there. Uh, I know they have uh, copies and they would love to sell those to you. I also wanted to make sure to uh, mention the uh, MFA in Literary Translation program at the university. They have been our partners on this uh, and have been wonderful partners for us uh, for years. And so I would like to thank uh, Aron and, and his uh, wonderful program for helping to make this possible as well. So thank you again. Thank you uh, to Maria and Curtis. Thank you. Enjoy your evening.